Presenting an historic John Anthony West speech, this is an Atlantis Rising magazine exclusive. A few years ago, during a late summer weekend, some of today's most provocative scientists, writers and researchers gathered on the banks of the Yellowstone River to consider evidence for and against impending Earth Changes. In very funny remarks at the Earth Changes 2000 conference, the late John Anthony West told the story of his battle with mainstream Egyptology over the true age of the Great Sphinx, as proven by water weathering. The audience loved it, the maverick Egyptologist and author of Serpent in the Sky, offered unique insights into the hopeful meaning of ancient myths of death and resurrection as expressed in symbolist Egyptology. West also took on the establishment over his case for a much more ancient Egyptian order than is acknowledged by academia. The principles upon which Egypt is based are eternal. This is undeniable. It's all there. It's all written down in number and geometry and harmony and measure and proportion and so on. And when these secrets are to a certain extent rediscovered by people who actually put those principles to practice in their own lives, then the possibility of a new civilization arises. In and of itself, as I said before, the dating of the Sphinx is neither here nor there. But what it does is that it has a very powerful and constructive <coughs> negative impact because, as I said earlier, the second strongest thing in the world is an idea whose time has not yet gone. And what has to happen before anything real, substantive, and positive and constructive can happen is that people have to get out of their heads the notion that progress equals civilization. Because we, as long as we think that we're advanced, the people who built the pyramids are primitive and sort of dry runs for our civilization, for progress, we're in trouble. But as soon as you reverse the process and say, no, what we do is tremendously clever, but emotionally barren and, and, and spiritually absolutely dead. Um, until we recognize that, nothing real can happen. So let's look at some of, the, some of those principles in action in Egypt and just see where it takes us. Probably into the middle of the morning. <laughs> um, See, we're doing, we're doing we're putting 16 days of Egypt into two hours or something, so. Anyway, okay, here we are looking at your character here. And Egypt expressed itself in myth and symbol. And to us, myth is virtually dead. We think of myth as a peculiar way the ancients had of, of trying to account for the mysterious universe. Actually, the more you study myth, the more you recognize how incredibly brilliant it is because it's, it's a means of transmitting without writing and irrespective of the understanding of the people who are actually transmitting it. As long as you can remember the myth, you can, read, you can transmit it. And you see when you get deep into it that it's a combination of profound scientific cosmology, of profound philosophy, of deep religion, of highly astute psychology and a certain amount of, hist of actual history thrown in there. And one of the problems with myth is trying to determine, it's very difficult to do, what's history, <coughs> what's psychology, and what is, um, and what is cosmology. And it's, it's sometimes very difficult, sometimes things are historical and cosmological at the same time. One of the problems that the literal-minded people like Zechariah Sitchin and people of that sort get into is trying to take the myths as nothing but garbled accounts of historical events. And so they'll talk about the time when Horus led the leaders into whatever or whatever, or the, you know, in, in, with Enlil and whoever at the head, the armies of Babylon invaded the armies of whatever. And so they try to, it's a kind of what I call galactic materialism, <clears throat> in which, or it's aliens who've done it. Um, and so they try to look into, they try to take literally what's actually meant as cosmology. They get into trouble, for example, with an Egyptian myth like Atum, who masturbates the universe into existence. Try to figure out how those were technologically, those were aliens who were caught doing something they shouldn't really have been doing behind the tree, and suddenly there's the universe. So there are certain things, there are certain things that, are, that are quite clearly cosmological, and those are left out of the equation. But when you look closely at it, you see that more of it is cosmological than is historical, but when you get to the catastrophes and the floods and stuff yeah. like that, then you're almost certainly talking, what? Oh, sorry. Then you're talking about, right? I'll have to get rid of that. <laughs> but, 
then you see that, that, that when you're talking about the deluges and the catastrophes, then you see that you probably are talking about history. But to try and disentangle this wonderful web of, of stuff that the, that, the, that the myths weave, you can see that you're in, you're in deep trouble because but it's, it's tremendously rich. And actually, when you know enough about it or you take it seriously enough, you find that the myths provide you with psychological insights into the leading of your daily life. I mean, the Horus myth, Arjuna, the Indian one as well, but the Horus myth in, in Egypt is a great lesson. I mean, if you're a heretic and you're fighting the battle, it's all there about how you have to fight the battle. I mean, it's a battle and to try and negotiate with the Setian forces on a, from a position of weakness is absolutely futile. You can only negotiate from a position of strength. And I mean, when you know this, not just theoretically, but you see that you can put it into practice. You can conduct the battle in a much more intelligent fashion than you could do if you didn't understand that that myth was telling you how to do it. Otherwise, you think of a lot of my new age friends are, you know, you've got to take the high road. You're the hell with the high road. I'll take the high road when I can climb out of the mud. I'm never worry about the high road. Until then, it's mud wrestling. <coughs> so, but anyway, these, the, myths, the myths have this extraordinary wisdom enshrined into them, scientific, religious, philosophical, and artistic as well. Symbolism is another version of the same kind of language. We've practically lost um, a symbolic way of thinking, and yet symbolism conveys to those who are brought up with that particular symbolic tradition a wealth of information that linear language won't do. And I can give an example of that, for example, um, an example of modern symbolism that still works. Um, not religious, but secular, is let's say the political cartoon where a clever, a clever um, uh, cartoonist will take, let's say, an international cartoon and will take Uncle Sam, um, the French La Liberté, the English John Bull, and the Russian Bear, now cut up into 14 pieces like Osiris, and juxtapose them in a certain way that conveys a very rich political picture. <coughs> and if you're to an Eskimo or a Zulu or a Martian, unaware of modern events, this symbolism won't mean anything. To anybody who follows the news, it conveys a very rich picture. And the more you know about the news, if it's a good cartoonist, the richer this picture will be, and you'll get it all at once. If you have to explain to somebody what this particular cartoon means, somebody who's absolutely blank, in other words, who knows nothing of Western history or modern politics, it would take you months of history lessons to teach that person why Uncle Sam for Uncle Sam and why the Russian bear for Russia, what the situation means, what the juxtaposition of all of those characters means. By the time you got done with this intensive three-month lesson in history, you'd have forgotten, and everybody would have forgotten what you said in the beginning. It would be almost impenetrable. But the single cartoon, as long as you know the language, gives you a, a total picture in one go. So when you go into an Egyptian temple now, and the walls are covered, this is a papyrus, but you go into a, a temple, basically it's the same sort of thing. And you see acres of these reliefs, most of which are pretty impenetrable to us. Even me, after all of these years of study, I go in and I know that, I can see that this character is this, and so on, and I know that each of the symbols has, each of the gestures has meaning, some of which I know, some of which I don't. Each of the emblems and insignia that's there has a meaning, but it's not my, I've had to learn this, so it's rare that I get the whole, let's say a hit of a whole picture the way you would from a political cartoon. You look at a cartoon, you go, ha, you see it in one. I mean, even I can't look at something like this and go, ha, I say, ah, yes, there's the scarab, and there's the snake with the consent of time, and there's Osiris, and there's the deceased who's, you know, who's about to get her soul measured and so on. So I can go through this and dope it out bit by bit, but I don't get that real, that instant like this. But an Egyptian priest walking through one of those temples is, is, is having a, a profound, the more instructed he is, the more, the more powerful the initiatic experience, but he's having an initiatic experience from the symbolism encoded on those walls. Because everything makes sense, everything is profoundly significant within its context, and so the whole thing gives you this, combined with the architecture itself, which is harmonious and proportional and consecrated to one of the gods who are not really gods in the sense that we like to think of them, but cosmic principles, each of which has, is related to a, a, a certain a 
certain, let's say, interplay of numbers, of number symbolism, of, which, which manifests in geometry, <coughs> harmony, and proportion, so that, the, so that the entire temple is a kind of sacred symphony in stone resonating to that particular principle. So when you walk into one of these places, what's happening is that you're having provoked within you, and I mean, it works universally, except on certain kinds of academics. It does not work on the emotionally <laughs> defective and the spiritually dyslexic. But on anybody whose emotional faculties are still functioning, you walk into one of these places and you know that you are in the presence of the God and that the God is being evoked in you and provoked in you. And this is how a civilization functions. This is what we're supposed to be doing, not shopping malls. And we've lost the, we've lost the ability to do so. Anyway, I digress as usual. But so just to go through the way, the way that this symbolism works, what certain of these things mean. Let's just take a look at this little winged scarab, which <clears throat> usually on the exoteric level is, is a symbol of the rising sun. The reason for that is very simple. The scarab is a dung beetle, and what it does is it, it lays its eggs in a little ball of dung, and then it rolls that ball of dung along the desert in the heat. Um, all day long, and at night it digs a little hole and it <coughs> buries the ball of dung in the hole. And in the morning when the sun comes up, it digs the hole up, brings the little dung ball out and starts rolling it along the desert. So as a symbol of sort of setting and rising sun, it's a kind of humble example of the sun, you know, the ball of dung, that's the sun goes down by day. This is not exactly a poetic metaphor, you wouldn't think. I mean, offhand, and the Egyptologists sometimes make fun of it. Incidentally, it's supposedly, <coughs> it's supposed to do this, it rolls the ball, ball of dung along the desert for 40 days, and never actually follow the scarab people to say it was 40 days or 38 days or 42 days, but mythologically it's 40 days, which is a number of completion. Moses in the wilderness, Christ fasting 40 days, 40 is a number of completion. Anyway, it's what happens inside the ball of dung that's significant. What happens is that the eggs hatch, the ball of dung ferments in the sun, and turns into a kind of dung beer. And the... Better than Budweiser. The little grubs feed on the, on the fermented dung, and they grow, of course, and then they, all of a sudden they, they, they go into the second stage. I think they're a grub, and then they're a larva. They, they transmute into a, into a higher form, and they continue to feed on the, on the dung. The dung, of course, esoterically represents matter in, in, in its grossest form. And the, 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 little, the little grubs are feeding on this. And then at a certain point, exactly like a butterfly, they're going through the same stages of metamorphosis. They spin for themselves a little bit of a, cuck, of a little cuck, cuck, cocoon. Whoops, why is that? Uh -oh. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I bet it didn't fall down. Didn't oh, well. There should be a slide in there that hasn't fallen. And another one. Okay, no matter what. Um, it spins a tiny little cocoon, and when you see that cocoon, it looks exactly like a mummy. And you see why the mummy is wrapped the way that it is. Because the dead pharaoh, or the dead whoever, inside those wrappings is effectively in the same stage as the chrysalis of a, of a butterfly, or in this case, of a scarab beetle. And it goes quiescent, as where effectively it dies. And then when its appointed time is up, the, in the case of the scarab, it bursts out of its cocoon, and it's winged creature, and it flies off into the sunlight. Anything that's winged represents the volatile, or spirit. And it flies off into the sunlight, and is it there? Maybe, maybe it's not a form, maybe it's not a not to worry about it. It's all right. It's just not dropping. It's just not dropping, yeah, it's okay. Um, and it flies off into the, into the sunlight as a winged creature or spirit. So as a metaphor, on its simplest level, it's just you know, burying its ball of dung at night and digging it up in the morning, or up rising in the rising sun. But on the esoteric level, it represents, <clears throat> it represents the transformational power of the sun because it's, it's the sun, it's the sun fermenting the dung that allows the scarab beetle to go from little grub to spiritual creature. In other words, it's the transformation of the carnal into the spiritual. Henceforth, or therefore rather, 
this, the humble dung beetle becomes the symbol of the rising sun, but more importantly, the transformational power of the sun. And so you see, there's a long explanation to get through the little scar beetle. Every single little bit and piece of Egypt can go back to the Oh, there it is. There we have it. Okay, you see, it looked exactly like a mummy. So you wonder why the mummy looks like a mummy? It's because the, the wrappings make it look like the like the chrysalis of a um, of a um, you know of an insect. <clears throat> now we get into certain of the other of the other mythologies and things. This is from the tomb of Ramses the Ninth. And again, you see this tremendous profusion of stuff that's going on here. I don't know why the focus focus doesn't work. Anyway, this is new to the sky. Anyway, all of this, this is very, very complex, but here, a very interesting, actually, this a singular representation, the only one that I know of in Egypt. Remember, I, I told you about the, the cosmology that to us is a pretty peculiar way to express divine cosmology of Atum, who is the self-created, who through an act of masturbation creates the first polarity, or a set of twins called, <coughs> called, called, uh, called Shu, and Tethnut. Again, I won't go into the into the esotericism of this, but here you have a represented a representation of actually of, of Atum creating the twins, Shu and Tefnut. But what's interesting here, the focus isn't good enough, is that the actual sperm cells are shown, and they're shown looking like sperm cells, like tiny little serpents. The Egyptians must have known that, or they wouldn't have done it that way. So there's a lot of very strange amount of science that goes into these strange into these extraordinary um, representations here. And I mean, it would take weeks, actually, to go through, and I couldn't do it even, <laughs> some of these things I don't know, but to go through this tableau here, you could spend a couple of hours there just brushing the surface on what all of these things mean. But to an Egyptian initiate, walks in and sees instantly that this is a profound message, as I said, at once, scientific, philosophical, artistic, <clears throat> and um, and psychological. More, all of this is cosmology that we're seeing here, and we're going, in fact, from there where we just saw Atum. We're, we're going to the, let's say, the galactic, the galactic, um, the, the formation of the of the universe itself. And as we go through the Egyptian cosmology, goes sort of like the Book of Genesis. Book of Genesis is a kind of portable version of Egypt take it into the desert with you. But the actual Egyptian cosmology is profoundly scientific and very much actually understood correctly. It, it relates to you know, many of the, of, the, of the leading edge ideas in modern cosmology. Here we have a character called Newt, um, the, the second set of, of twins created out of what's called the Heliopolitan Aeneid. It's a group of nine gods. Shu and Tefnut represent basically extension or, or, or space. So was, she was often called the god of the air, but that really doesn't cover it. It's, it's really the principle of extension, and the principle she was often called the goddess of moisture. That also doesn't mean anything. I mean, the feminine is always associated with, with moisture and the matrix. In other words, that, that which, is, which represents the fertile ground from which creation will spring. And they produce a set of twins called Geda Nut. Nut represents the sky, Geda the earth, Egypt reverses the polarity that's common to most, um, most symbolic um, systems in that the, the sky is the matrix of all. In other words, the, the, the feminine is the matrix, the sky. And the earth, which is usually, we always talk about Mother Earth, the sky is actually masculine. And Nud is often shown, you see here, here she is at Dendra as a woman, arched over you know, a square ceiling, the square representing the four, the four elements actually, the square is always, in, in all cultures actually, represents substance or substantiality, the principle of manifestation. And here you see that she's actually giving birth to the sun by day. Here she's swallowing the sun by night, and here she's giving birth to the sun by day, wearing a dress that is all made up of the, all of those wavy lines, is the, is, the, is the symbol for water. It's the water symbol, but the wavy line itself represents actually the principal wave form <coughs> through which creation manifests. You know, no cosmologist or physicist would disagree with that, but in the beginning, let's say, it was vibration. And vibration is actually the alternation between positive and negative poles. 
So at the very beginning there's a principle, positive and negative, and enshrined in this little drawing is a tremendous amount of scientific information, even including the key here she's giving birth to the sun by day, and the rays of the sun, nine of them, not an accident, are raying down, actually this is a facade of the temple itself, there should be a drawing here, no it isn't, I had a drawing that makes this a little bit clearer, but one of the interesting things here, when, in fact, when Dave was talking earlier today about the different symbols that keep showing the same kind of manifestation, and there are several ways of looking at that, and he was, he was looking at an actual, you know, at a, at a, at a, um, a worldwide phenomenon in which, in which the various symbolic representations are, are capturing a, a physical, a universal physical appearance, as it were, and this you see all over the place. I mean, I wouldn't argue with that, with that interpretation, but also underlying it, in fact, because I'm counting, when he was showing those things, I'm counting the stars, for example, and all of those stars of Isis and Ishtar and all of that are all eight-pointed stars. They have an eight symbolism in them, and actually Venus, Ishtar, um, uh, uh, Isis, are associated with the number eight because eight is the number that in astrology, in Western astrology, this, is, this pertains as well. Eight is a number associated with sex, death, and renewal. And for those of the goddesses associated with sex, death, and renewal. So the longer you look at the symbolism, the more instruction comes out of it. And one of the tricks is not to focus in on this meaning rather than that, because sometimes it's all of those meanings put together, many layered. Anyway, here, this is a particularly interesting one, and you see this a lot in later Kingdom Egypt. You see that the way the sun rays are being shown the not straight rays, which we saw on um, the ones that, that David was showing. Um, there are a lot of those where you see rays of sun. But here the Egyptians are showing, they're actually little, little papyrus flowers, but they're in packets, actually. And this is a very strange way to portray light raining down from the sun. And there are some people who think, and I'm one of, uh, among them, that they understood the quantum, that, that, light, that light is actually delivered in quanta in separate little packets, because otherwise, very hard to explain. That's not an arbitrary way of The sun doesn't look that way. It doesn't look like it's coming to you in packets. Very interesting, <clears throat> very interesting way of going about it. Now here you have all of these phantasmagorical uh, ceilings. This is an astronomical ceiling, and this represents the pole here, the, the celestial pole, again, what we were talking about earlier. But here it's represented in a very interesting fashion. Now the the animals that are associated with the gods or with the principles in Egypt are always chosen for a very good reason and usually that reason is pretty easy to understand. The more you know about the animal, the more you can see why it and not some other is chosen for that particular role. In this case, this is the goddess Taurai, Tauret, the upright hippopotamus who is the goddess or the principle associated with pregnancy and gestation. Because what could be more pregnant than a pregnant hippopotamus? <laughs> <laughs> and here you have the crocodile on, on her back. The crocodile, for fairly obvious reasons, is associated with death. So what you have at the pole star of creation, of the universe, as it were, are the twin principles of, 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 of death and renewal. All very clever. And if you look at this this way, it looks fantastic and phantasmagorical, but when you start decoding it, you see that everything is chosen for a very specific and very profound reason. <clears throat> now we're coming to, so there we're at the, in other words, we're at the, we're at the pole there. We're, we're going down the, we're, we're, we're going down the, the um, or through the steps of Genesis, getting closer and closer to life as we know it, life on earth. Here we have the ram-headed sphinxes at the, outside the, the temple of, of Karnak. This is one of the reasons to make us, uh, one of the good reasons, you notice that even Dr. Deeper said, well, we, you know, we, we, we've got to keep an open mind about this. This is the only thing he said we have to keep an open mind about, but was the knowledge of procession. And you see that right in Luxor, just on schedule, 2000 BC, when the Age of Aries came in, the symbolism of Luxor changed from bull symbolism to ram symbolism. Amon, the principle that was elevated to hegemony in Luxor <coughs> was associated with the ram, often referred to as the great ram in the sky. And so here we have in all the years this series of ram-headed sphinxes. So we're getting now into, let's say, into the zodiacal <coughs> universe. We go a little bit further here, 
Now here we're talking about, here we are with, with life itself, actually. We have the Ankh symbol. Lots of explanations for the Ankh symbol. The best one is probably, although it's quite orthodox, that it represents the fusion of male and female principles. The loop at the top representing a symbolized womb. The <clears throat> cross over here representing male genitalia. Fusion of male and female, if you can't think of a better way of, of symbolizing life itself. <clears throat> we continue here, now we're into the human, into the human reign here. This is the dead Osiris on his funeral bier, and you see with his erect phallus that he has it just for this night provided by a god called Sokar. This has been hammered out probably by the Christians. They were very good at hammering out the Sokar. <laughs> 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 the whole story of effacements in, in Egyptian temples is a very complex one. When you go to Egypt, you see, particularly in the later temples, a lot of figures have been carefully effaced. It's always thought by, by some Christian iconoclasts, but actually it isn't. It's the priests themselves. Long out, I won't go into this, but it's the priests themselves actually deconsecrating the temples when their time is over, and really their, the age of Egypt is over. So they're, they're putting the temples, they're putting to rest that which is proper to put to rest, and leaving uneffaced that which pertains to the age to come, which would make a very good, very interesting PhD study. Anyway, there's Osiris on his beer. <clears throat> You probably all know at least enough of the myth without me having to go through it. I can see some people are starting to nod here, so we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, and <clears throat> what will happen is that Isis has re reconstituted the, the, the dismembered body of, of Osiris, uh, which Set, his, his wicked brother, has, uh, sorry, yes, his brother Set has dismembered. Um, and the only part missing is the phallus, which is provided by a god called Sokar. And here's Isis in the form of a falcon or kite, arguments over this, <clears throat> inseminating herself. This is actually an Egyptian representation of what in Christianity becomes the Immaculate Conception. Um, in fact, virtually everything in esoteric Christianity comes directly out of Egypt. The busybody stuff, the Egypt didn't, didn't come out of Egypt. That the Christians invented for themselves. But <laughs> the doctrine of immortality comes right out of Egypt, unmistakably. And my own conviction is that, that the church is going to continue into the next millennium in recognizable form. It will have to stop thinking it invented all of this stuff and realize that it's the legitimate successor to an earlier, but actually much more complex and coherent tradition and then maybe it will survive. To me, it won't bother me if it doesn't. <laughs> <clears throat> now this is the weighing of the famous weighing of the heart, and now we're in the human sphere. And this is, this is the purpose of the whole exercise. As I said earlier, Egypt, Egypt is a one-issue a one civilization. Its, its interest is not in death. It's always, it's always say, oh, the Egyptians were preoccupied with death. They weren't. They were preoccupied with death as the transitional phase to immortal life. It was immortal life that interested them and that ought to interest us. But you can imagine what would happen. You watch these guys up there now talking about the issues. And they're, I mean, very interested in the seniors, that's me, um, talking about, you know, who's going to pay for what, how much for the prescription drugs are going to be paid for, and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. I mean, really, to an Egyptian, they laugh. I mean, we should be thinking about our immortal souls, not about how much we're going to have to pay for the Viagra. Less. <laughs> anyway, so what's happening here is that the, the heart is being the heart is being weighed against the feather of Ma, who represents equilibrium or cosmic equilibrium or justice. And if the heart <coughs> if the heart is lighter than the feather, um, <coughs> the the deceased goes on. And then it gets complicated into new life, which probably means reincarnation. The, Egyptologists don't think the Egyptians believe in reincarnation, but I'm very certain that they did. <clears throat> and from the, the Horus the Horus standpoint, which is which is available to the king, supposedly only the king, but in actuality the king simply the king simply symbolizes the ability to go to become divine within a single lifetime, that actually becomes Christianity. But Egypt actually intertwined these two paths of, of reincarnation and, uh, and resurrection. And if you don't pass, it gets thrown to this composite monster here, part baboon, part crocodile, part, um, uh, part lion, um, 
hippo actually, it depends, different, different pictures of this. It's called the eater of the dead. So what happens with Egypt, you don't go to hell if you haven't done your work. What happens is that your name, your individuality is erased. In other words, your divine spark, which we're all born with, gets thrown back into the divine spark gene pool, and it might as, you might as well not have lived. The Egyptians didn't really recognize a hell. That's a Christian invention, and then they tried to make the world conform to it. <clears throat> now we get into some very interesting bits and pieces of symbolism, <clears throat> which I won't go into in detail, but this is a bot so-called botanical garden at the back of the Temple of Karnak. These are lotus flowers, which again have very rich symbolism. And you see that the lotus here is, is producing new flowers out of its corolla. What's being symbolized here in very subtle fashion is the ability of matter to divinize itself, to exalt itself without sexual reproduction. This happens in botany, but it's very, very rare. This is effectively a born-again flower. This is a, this is a representation. This is what, but in Christianity, that's what's really meant by born again. It means born a spiritual rebirth in the middle of life. That's what they're talking about. They would never know it. Um, so anyway, this is, this is, the Egyptians have millions and millions of, of symbols and metaphors to represent exactly you know, the different aspects of this very rich doctrine. <clears throat> and here we have the, the rearing cobras and the wall of Saqqara. Now the serpent again, very, very rich symbol. There are the, uh, negative serpents representing all sorts of things, the, the, the setian or negative forces. That which set, by the way, is sometimes called the god of evil. There is no god of evil. What there is is an opposing or a denying force. Set represents, set represents, is that all vodka? <laughs> set action is very easy to understand the opposing force. Um, Horus basically represents what becomes in Christianity the Christ, the, 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 the drive toward divine life, toward resurrection or salvation, whatever word you want, name you want to put to it. Set represents that which opposes the return to the source. In other words, that which that which is earthbound, the material world, but without the material world, nothing happens. It's very easy to understand the setting and force. When I turn on my computer, that blank screen is set, <laughs> defying me to put the words down there at all, much less in the right order. Very easy to understand set, actually, and when you understand set in even more or less the right way, you realize that for the Egyptians, it's a very important god. There were pharaohs named Seti, which means he of set. The Egyptians recognized the that the opposition had to be actually honored and worked with and conquered. And once conquered, reconciled. Very difficult. But once you understand that this is the case, you don't try to get rid of the bad guys, as it were. You have to just get on top and reconcile. Anyway, this is the, the rearing cobras who represent, in this case, the, the serpent, the rearing serpent, represents the rising Kundalini. And this is, this is formal. The Egyptians understood this perfectly well. And you see sometimes the diadem of the pharaoh with the rearing cobra on the forehead right over here. It represents the kundalini rising to the third eye. No mistake. In that. <clears throat> here we have more of the symbols actually. You can see them. This is Horus and Set very briefly over a, an effaced figure of Hatshepsut. Won't go into that here. And Horus representing the, the, the principle of resurrection. He's shown as a falcon. His animal is the falcon or his bird. Reason being, the falcon is a bird that flies high in the eye of the sun, sort of hovering, almost invisible. When it sees its quarry, it folds its wing, dives, the technical word is stoops, a tremendous speed, a couple hundred miles an hour, seizes its quarry, and then swoops back up again, invisible, into the eye of the sun. In other words, as a principle, as an exemplar of the return to the source, you couldn't do better. Thoth, or Jehuti, <coughs> is shown either ibis headed or as a baboon. Why those choices for the god of wisdom? If you watch the ibis, the ibis is a wading bird, a very intelligent bird actually, walking through the water, endlessly searching for its food. <laughs> endlessly. So, search as one aspect of wisdom. And the baboon is an animal that, if you watch it, one, it greets the sun in the morning. It makes a terrific racket greeting the sun. And then often it spends a lot of its time just kind of squatting on the ground, apparently lost in contemplation. So if you look at the twin aspects of the search for wisdom, search and contemplation, you'd be hard, hard to find better than that. And so with all of the animals, insects, birds, associated with the Egyptian gods or principles, if you look for the reason why they're chosen, you find them. 
<clears throat> okay, and here's the strange set animal. Here we have set, a very complex thing, offering life to Horus, no less, and set the big arguments over what this strange head of set is meant to represent. Probably what it means is just animal. It's no specific animal, and this is very wise. In other words, set has many aspects, sometimes a hippopotamus, sometimes a jackass, sometimes a politician. Um, <laughs> but set has many aspects, but the actual set animal is indefinable, almost certainly. The, even the Egyptologists have come out with that themselves. Other people have done that, but they recognize this too. Egyptology is changing very slowly. About as, the next time Pluto comes around in orbit, <laughs> they'll know something. <laughs> These are the greyhounds of Horus. They call the greyhounds of Horus, the Egyptian greyhounds. They represent instinct under control. As soon as you hear the greyhounds of Horus, you know that you're looking not just at a scene from daily life. The animals of the desert, the untamed, are the animals of Set. I have a thing about dogs, always did. It's a beautiful drawing of one of those dogs. And, interestingly enough, they still exist. There is one. They stay pure on the island of Ibiza, where I lived for many years. And I've always had those dogs. I imported them. Now I don't. This one died some years back, and now I'm traveling all the time, so I can't have them. But they're really great dogs and descended from the ancient hunting dogs in Egypt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here we have Sekhmet, everybody's favorite goddess, who represents the female aspect of the fire principle. She is the wife or the consort of Ptah, who is the architect of heaven and earth. Ptah has ideas, but is incapable of manifesting them. He's often shown in mummy wrapping, clutching the symbols of power. It's Sekhmet who actually makes everything happen. I mean, if you look at the habits of lions, you'll see why Sekhmet is chosen for this role. The male lion basically does nothing. He sits around and roars and chases all the other guys away. And it's Sekhmet who does all of the work, all of the nurturing, all of the hunting. I sort of like it that way. You know? but, this is why Sekhmet was chosen for this, and she is the very close to the Egypt, to the Indian Kali. She makes things happen, and she she actually is also associated with healing, but healing by purgation, healing through fire. Um, and this is a spectacular Sekhmet in a little shrine in Karnak. And whenever we go to, when on my trips, we get a meditation session in here and sit in the presence of the goddess. Very few people come out of there unmoved. It's quite an experience. And hmm, this is out of there. This is Horus. I don't know why it's won't focus. Well, it doesn't work on this thing. Anyway, you've seen pictures of Horus, but that's the. Oh, thank you. Even this is in Ptolemaic times when Egypt is getting quite corrupt, but even in corrupt times, there are geniuses, and that's a genius artist at work. And this gorgeous Horus outside the temple of, of Edfu. <clears throat> and then over here, again. This is particularly interesting. This drawing comes from the second shrine of Tutankhamun in, in the Cairo Museum, and it shows these mummiform figures in the actual, in the actual uh, golden relief. There's a whole bunch of these guys, but it's hard to see, actually, as a relief. And you see that here you have a star lined up in, with three rows of, three, three rays of consciousness or energy to the third eye of the mummified pharaoh. And as soon as you see this relationship between stellar and human consciousness, you know that there's an astrology of some sort at work there. It doesn't mean it told you a good day to bet on a, you know, to buy a stock or buy a poodle, but it, it, it obviously means that the Egyptians understood. The opposition would say believed, I would say understood. This connection between stellar and human consciousness, which is, of course, that, again, another way of expressing that quest for immortality. Now we just have a very quick run through Egypt, which has the, the peculiarity, actually, of being at its height, at its, at its very, very beginning. It's an odd thing, which we tend to think in terms of development, but Egypt was at its height, at its beginning, and if we take its beginning, we give or take the Sphinx theory that puts this thousands and thousands of years earlier, whenever you put it, it's at the beginning. If it's an earlier stage of civilization, it's still the beginning. But that's, that's Egypt at its, at its most spectacular, the Sphinx and the temple surrounding it. <clears throat> we then go into the pyramids, which, as I said, are, are superimposed upon earlier structures, but are, in fact, old kingdoms. There we have our pyramids. Here we have Saqqara, which actually predates the present pyramids. <clears throat> but um, as you see, there's the step pyramid, and here are the reconstructed shrines in here. And you see this has a 
Very modern look. Oh, hell. Can, actually, this is an important one. Can you make this one draw? We'll go back and come up, come up to it again. Okay, let's try it. No, go one more. Go one more. Is that it? No. Go back again. Zero all slides. Oh well, all right, we'll live without it. It was a, it's a reconstruction, it's a reconstruction of the an architect's reconstruction of the whole complex of um, the whole complex. Should I go back? That's all right. That's all it's a reconstruction of the whole complex of Saqqara um, by a, by an architect. And when you look at it, when you look at the at what we have, you see, I mean this is a ruined old, you know, remarkable building or, or set of buildings. But when you see the reconstruction, you'd look at it and say, wow, you know, if somebody told you that was the new campus for the University of New Mexico or Arizona, you'd say, you know, who's the genius architect that did that? Because it absolutely looks like high-tech modern architecture at its very, very best, which is no accident, actually, because the builders of the Bauhaus in the turn of the century, looking for a way out of the Victorian clutter, went back to Egypt rather than to Greece and Rome, which the classic, classic, classicist. Um, arch architects did in the in the 18th century. They went back to Egypt for the model of how clean, functional architecture should look. So actually, when you do see good modern buildings, there's a and they look sort of Egyptian. It's not an accident because that's that's what they used as their model, which is kind of interesting because architecture is often the harbinger of what is to come. Unfortunate, but very rare that a, a good architect get gets a good architect gets a an opportunity to stress, to, to do his stuff, because usually he's doing gas stations and shopping malls. And there's not much opportunity for a divine architecture there. Anyway, here we are in the Old Kingdom again. This is Fourth Dynasty. And you see these extraordinary inlaid eyes made of different kinds of quartz crystal. Now, the amazing thing about these eyes is that after the Fourth Dynasty, the Egyptians lost the art. But in order to do this, according to Shvala de Lubitsch, all of my work is, is based upon the symbolist uh, interpretation of Egypt developed by this great uh, French um, philosopher and mathematician. Um, the, the, in order to make an eye like this, one, you have to work with very, very hard materials, quartz crystal, but you also, have to, you also have to know about the anatomy of the eye and understand its refractive and its reflective, reflective qualities to reproduce an eye that actually looks back at you. It's only in the last 40 or 50 years that we've been able to reproduce or to make glass eyes that are as good as these Egyptian eyes done somewhere 24, 2500 BC. So this actually gives you an indication of the, the level of medical knowledge that was available in those times. Subsequently, that went degenerate. John, another... we're going to have to stop uh, for technical changes. All right. OK. Hold on. It's good. Fine. <coughs> I've only have a couple of minutes more, actually, about another five minutes, so don't run away yet. Okay. Okay. absolutely 20th century and modern, set against the cliff. Fabulous. This is early, the very beginnings of the New Kingdom. And now we go through the New Kingdom. There's uh, the, the, the wonderful Hathor columns in that temple of Hatshepsut with her cow ears, Hathor. One of, her rep one of her manifestations is as the provider of cosmic nourishment, the animal that provides nourishment par excellence is the cow. So there is this association of Hathor with with a cow and other aspects, she's associated with Aphrodite and love, dance, sexuality, and so on. <coughs> Here we have the facade of Abu Simbel, uh, the great temple of Ramses II, far to the south in, in Nubia. 
And when you look at this, and this is you know, pretty impressive big statues, but you get a sense of scale, it tells you what you're looking at. <laughs> you see these things, and you say, ah, oh, yeah, if you're going to be king, that's that's how you do it. <laughs> This is what you're doing in the game. And there we have, now it's all getting, you see, it goes, as I said, from, from, from fabulous, uh, the, the earlier stages of Egypt are, are unmatched anywhere in the world for the, for, the, for the sense of both power and serenity that you get out of it. I mean, the thing is, is like this, but it's pure, it's clean. As it goes on, it gets much more complex and, and Rococo, Baroque and then Rococo. And here we are in Ptolemaic times, this is the Temple of Dendera, as, as Napoleon found it up to the, up to the, uh, you know, up to the, up to the capitals in, uh, in, in sand. And you see how elaborate the, the, the capitals, the columns are getting in the, 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 the uh, whoops, sorry. Okay, and here you see what's happened to the artwork itself. It's got corrupted. These are no longer, these are no longer um, the, the clean lines of the earlier work in Ptolemaic times. The, there wasn't that much money left to keep this constant train, uh, core of highly trained virtuo, virtuoso artic, artisans working full time. So whenever there was a bit of money to spare, the Ptolemies would finance temple building, but had to make do with, as it were, hired hands. And even the figures changed. If you look at, very interesting, maybe even deliberate, when you look at old kingdom reliefs and statues, the men all look like long distance runners and the women like models, when fashion models, when you get into the new kingdom, the men all look sort of like football players and the, the women like, like sex symbols. And when you get to Ptolemaic times, everybody looks like they've just come back from the orgy, including the, including the gods themselves, with their sort of exaggerated buttocks and their big belly buttons and, and so on. The whole, the whole thing looks like, gives you a sense of, of overripe fruit, fruit ready to drop off the tree. A sense of civilization in the last stages of decline. And, and probably, in, in, art, art follows that progression anyway. We watch even Western art, you see it starts off simple gets increasingly complex and then kind of caves in under its own weight. This is why architecture is so interesting and then starts to recover and it's often architecture that leads the way into, into going back to a, a pure form as it were. The trouble is in the Church of Progress it doesn't get much, much chance to, to handle the divine. <coughs> and now here we have, we've got into Gre Greco-Roman Greco times and here we have our, our friend here who really just has come back from the orgy. <laughs> but when you're in Egypt, it's very interesting, after we spend a couple of weeks going through this absolutely unparalleled art and architecture, and then we finish up. We used to go to Alexandria, but the feedback was that it was too long to go to absorb this single lesson. But we finish up in the Greco-Roman room at the Cairo Museum. And there you see what happens when a, when a civilization based upon spirit and upon the principle of immortality gives way to one that has lost sight of spirit and is dedicated basically to the things of this world. And nothing wrong with the things of this world. The Egyptians knew how to enjoy themselves very, very well. But if that's all you think about, that's what you get. And now we're watching, here's the, 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 the barber, the symbol for the soul in Greco-Roman Greco times. And I hope you know, here's a New Kingdom version of the same thing. You see the pure lines, this is on the papyrus. You see the pure lines of the iconography and in Greco-Roman times the whole thing is falling apart. <clears throat> and here you have the Sphinx reduced to Tony the Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> here you have the, this, is, this is the last gasp of Egyptian, the last gasp of, of, of ancient Egypt. These are tombs in Alexandria called the catacombs of, of, of Como Tugatha. And here you have the, the pure Egyptian symbolism with all sorts of, of Greco-Roman, um, you know, this is the bull, the, the great bull of, 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 of the Apis bull, as it's called, it's associated with Osiris and with the Ka. And you see, it looks like a sort of an underground Disneyland. The whole thing has become degenerate. Here's the rearing cobra, again, looking like, you know, a fun figure in a fun house. The whole thing has lost its spirit and it's completely degenerated. <clears throat> and then what happens is Christianity takes over and it does not actually efface all of the stuff in the early days. It took them a while to learn to be as intolerant as they finally became. 
although they were practicing right from the beginning. But instead what happens is they take over the temples, this is Philae and Aswan, and they cut the Coptic cross into the columns and simply appropriate the, appropriate the temple for themselves. And in fact, so we're perfectly okay because in fact the doctrine, esoteric Christianity, is the identical doctrine of that which is practiced in Egypt. It's the return to the source. And then it goes to its final stage of indignity, the backdrop on the back of a camel. <laughs> at this stage, basically, you can say that Egypt is all over, and we're back to our prophecy that I read you from the Hermetica. <clears throat> and, but the principle of the idea of the thing is that Seth has to become, this is a very unusual relief here, of this single human, single figure, but with the fused heads of, 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 of Seth and, uh, and, and Horus. In other words, Horus and Seth rec reconciled uh, upon a single body. And that is the, actually that's the, the objective of the entire exercise is not to kill Seth. You can't kill Seth. Kill, kill Seth, everything goes. And without Seth, there's no manifestation. But that's the, that's the object of the exercise, very rare representation. Oh, here we have, I didn't realize I still had that in here. Here's the actual tomb of, 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 of the second shrine of Tutankhamun with the stars connected to the heads. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. It's in there. But you see a very extraordinary <coughs> relief. And then finally, here we have it again. So you get the message there. And normally, I would read that prophecy from the Hermetica at this stage here, because it has a certain bang read at that stage, but I wanted to get it in for reasons of my own, which I think you understand mm -hmm. earlier, talking about esoteric Egypt. But that's, the, that's basically the, that's a, insofar as it's possible to do in an hour and a half, an overview of what, of what all of this scholarship is really for, because it is not just to redate the Sphinx or to make us rethink history, even that is even, even that is of no vast consequence, really. What is what is important is to is to actually is to demonstrate that that the Church of Progress has it all wrong, and that we are not accidental glitches in a meaningless universe. That we really do have a role to play in the in the in the operation says in the Hermetica itself, in the, in the operations of the heavens themselves, and it, it's up to us to actually understand this, not just with our heads, well it's nice to read about, but to actually try to put it into practice. And it's at that stage when enough people understand it, and the ground is cleared, and the Church of Progress no longer has the, the, the hold that it has over people's minds, it has less of a hold over people's hearts than its own high priesthood would like to imagine. Because people are very interested in the, and exactly in the stuff that we're doing. And, but it's only when, when, that, when that philosophy or that set of ideas loses its power that it becomes possible to reinitiate or to reinstitute re, re a new version of the ancient ideas. Because those are the correct ideas, but you can't use them in, the, in that form. But that's the purpose of the exercise, actually, which is precisely to clear the ground and make way for the planting of the new seeds, which will grow up, not identical to the old seeds, but in a, in a, in a, legitimately, in a legitimate form appropriate to the new age, which is the age of Aquarius, which has its own, its own, its own soul, its own way, a proper way of doing it. The Egyptian way is the proper way of doing it then. And it's only at that stage that a new civilization can replace the one that we have, which is not civilization at all, as I said, it's shiny barbarism. And you just have to hope, work, pray that it's not too late, because maybe it is. I, I like to think it isn't, but we're getting, the time's getting short now, and uh, especially for those who want to go to bed. So let's, let's do it. Thank you. Yes, well, it's a Moses Stila, the one that, that Shank showed. 
says the Sphinx is speaking there, but I mean, you don't know whether to take that literally or metaphorically, but he's saying, took Moses, my son, I'm covered with sand, etc., etc., etc. It is the Sphinx speaking in that, in that steel. But actually, in ancient Egypt, and the Sphinx is supposedly built by Khafra, but there's the first record of it in Egypt is that steel a thousand years after it's supposedly built. So it's, it becomes quite clear, and we look deep into it, that the Sphinx was a mystery to the Egyptians themselves. And actually, somebody told me this, and I'm not going to able to track it down. But somebody once said, one of the, one of the Edgar Casey people told me that, that Casey once said, and I don't think it's recorded in the readings or something like that, but somehow he said that, that the Sphinx was a mystery to the Atlanteans. Casey himself said that somewhere. And actually, if, the Atlantean, if there is anything to this Atlantis thing, I mean, I think, the, I mean, I, I always say Atlantis in quotes because I don't like to say that it's in the middle of the ocean here or there because none of that so far has, has, has been validatable. But that there was that earlier situation, that civilization, obviously, I'm, I'm absolutely certain of that. And, and my inclination is to think that the Sphinx is way back in the beginnings and, you know, there may be something to that notion that even the Atlanteans didn't know what the hell to make of the Sphinx. Uh, would you care to comment on one place where the Sphinx seems to appear in kind of mythology or classical literature is in the play of Oedipus, where the Sphinx is uh, guarding the city and asks riddles. Right. On the you know, that it ends up as the answer is is man. What yeah. Well, the mean? Greeks were so stupid they couldn't figure out that anybody else would figure out. <laughs> <laughs> Because it walks on three legs. Well, the Greeks appropriated the Sphinx. I mean, the Greeks, a, a very interesting book, Black Athena, by, by uh, the Afro-Asiatic roots of Greek civilization by Martin Bernal, goes into the Egyptian, the, 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 the debt owed, you know, I mean, the, the, the tremendous influence that Egypt had upon Greece, which the Greeks, the, the Greeks themselves acknowledged. It was simply the, it was the, I mean, Bernal does a very good job of showing that basically history as we learn it, is effectively a 19th century white supremacist con job in which, in which civilization, that means us, has to have been white and European and the, the Greeks are of course the swarthy little guys but they're white enough compared to the Egyptians. <laughs> so, so, um, so this is, you know, this is, this is the con job that I foisted, foisted upon us but the Greeks certainly appropriated the Sphinx, made the Sphinx female the shot was sort of not only semi-joking when he said, as far as he's concerned, the Sphinx is a woman. According to Frank Domingo, it's a kind of a, a face that could be masculine or feminine, hard to say. Sometimes you can see a face is absolutely masculine or absolutely but feminine, but could be. That's anyway. the only place classically I've ever heard of the Sphinx appearing. Now, it does give you some insight into the mindset perhaps, of the ancient times regarding the Sphinx. And it was what do you mean ancient times? I mean outside of Egypt? I'm, yes. Because there are thousands of Sphinxes all over Egypt. Oh, oh, I'm just, it's the only, what, is there any other place where the Sphinx appears in like... Oh, in Greece, yeah, and I, I think else, I'm not sure of Eastern and Mesopotamia elsewhere, I'm not, I'm just not certain okay. about that. But Greece, yeah, all over the place. I mean, yes, in, in the, in, is it Oedipus? Yes, yeah, it's an Oedipus that, that, uh, that it shows up. There, but then there are lots of Greek sphinxes where it's shown as, but they change it. It's got lie. It's got wings. It's a winged sphinx, and it's got woman. It's got it's got breasts. And it's, it's a woman, but with a lion's body. So it's changed around a lot. Yes. You mentioned some evidence of, of earlier placement of Khafre and Ankara's pyramid. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit more? And also, how do you consider the possibility? The subterranean chamber in the Great Pyramid could be an earlier. Mm -hmm. I have, I have indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could well be. And in fact, in the Menkara Pyramid, also there are there are different sets of chambers that don't figure as, as, as one as one construction. But the in terms of the of the earlier construction of, of Khafre, well, it's just it's there. You see what I was showing you. You see that the bottom courses and those paving stones around it. In Menkara, it's more complicated. It's got the granite casing over it, and the whole thing, Menkara is a very complex because it has additions of all different dynasties, fifth, sixth, very complicated to try and unravel Menkara. So I, I generally leave that one alone simply because ugh, they just get lost in the thickets there. Yes? In the hieroglyphics, there are these uh, little inserts that are sometimes different colors, and it, it shows uh, 
uh, the gods or whatever. It looks like the storyline's reading along, and there's a. Is that a time thing or a tense thing or a? Oh, I'd have to show you exactly what you mean, but all, but all of the colors. I mean, nothing is arbitrary in these. It's like a little cartoon thing of what are they thinking in their head. It's, it falls in, into place here and there. Uh, I, you'd have to show it to me. Okay. Like that, but uh, if there are different colors, each of the colors has its own symbolic significance. Okay. There's nothing that isn't, even the Egyptologists acknowledge this. They just think that the, that the message is, is nonsense and superstition. But even they acknowledge that every single icon iconographic detail has a purpose and a meaning. Nothing is arbitrary. Yes. Is anyone currently looking along the bed of the old Nile for this earlier silver? No, but uh, this is this is something that would be very interesting to do. I'm not even sure. I don't know if Shot knows. Do you know Shot? Much work has been done on where the bed of the old bed of the Nile is. Not a lot has been done. On not much has been done. That I, that I want to do. Yeah, when somebody yeah, actually, oh, I didn't Nile, mention this. Nile we, has migrated back and forth. Mm. But I think it may have been, you know, it wouldn't surprise me, but it may be geological time. If it's where they now have the new canal going down those series of depressions and oases far to the west. And actually, I, I should have mentioned this actually earlier. We've set up, I'm a foundation now. We've set up a...